tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor Charles Shaughnessy and artist-actor Tom Birds. Actor Charles Shaughnessy was born and raised in London, was in a grade school plays, graduated from Eton College, and went on to earn a law degree at Cambridge University. He was part of the L.A. theater scene, spent eight years on Days of Our Lives, where he took three soap opera digest awards home, and six years on CBS's The Nanny. Uh, you've seen him in film, and you've heard him as Dennis the Goldfish in Disney Stanley. What does a goldfish <laughs> sound like? <laughs> wow, I should retire. That's quite a full life already. And what does a goldfish sound like? Good question. You know, um, when I did the voice, I was trying to think of that exact uh, yes. thing. You know, you go for an audition, and I'm going, bloop, 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 bloop. <laughs> but we settled on, uh, on a sort of, he talks a bit like that, actually. It's a great big world out there, isn't it, boys and girls? And it was a, it was a throwback to sort of voices I'd heard as a kid, sort of almost out of a Punch and Judy show. You is know? that right? And, uh, you know, you just go in the audition, you put down what you think a goldfish is going to sound like, and my goldfish sounded like that. And someone somewhere went, oh, that one, out of like thousands of different ones. They went, that, that's a goldfish. That's what a goldfish sounds like. He was an English goldfish. So he was an English goldfish. <laughs> he yeah, he's a very, very smart English goldfish. That's what he was. <laughs> and, he, and he won an Emmy award. And he won an Emmy, that, yeah. He? he went to Cambridge University and won an Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> what a good fish. So why did you study law? Good question again. Uh, you know, my, um, I'd always wanted to act ever since uh, grade school. I grade did Peter school. Rabbit when I was five years old. And uh, um, and from that moment, I knew I wanted to be an actor. But my entire family was in showbiz by that time. I was going to say you had yeah, a prominent family. My dad was family. a writer. My mom was an actress. My brother then, at the last minute, having not been interested in acting, suddenly decided he was going to be an actor. Not doing that, but turned out to be a really good actor. So oh, he um, did too. Yeah, he kind of like he was my younger brother, but he bypassed me. He suddenly did a sort of end run, and and announced that he was going off to drama school, and turned out to be extremely talented. So I saw that and went, well, wait a minute, you know, this is crazy. And we you're can't in law all do school it. at the time? No, I, that was before. So that was deciding. I thought we can't all be, <coughs> oh, I we can't see. all be penniless I minstrels. See. Someone exactly. has to earn some money. So I'd do something sensible. So I went to Cambridge to be a lawyer and oh. um, <laughs> save the family from penury. And it just didn't work out. I just didn't, I didn't want to. You'd rather be poor. I just, yeah. <laughs> It poor. didn't work out. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out the people I was around. Someone said something very interesting to me. They said, when you're trying to figure out what you want to be when you grow up, don't try and think of the career because you don't know. You've never tried anything. Think of the people you want to be around. Oh, that's a good idea. Just think of who it? the sorts of people you want to be around to, do, to spend your life with. And I thought, well, I, I love people in this business. So. But that was your family. That was You'd my been family. around so them, right? Yeah, that's what I knew. So why did you come to the U.S.? Love. Love. It was love. That's lasted forever. Love has lasted for 25 <laughs> glorious years and two gorgeous uh, girl daughters. So, yeah, uh, yeah my um, wife was at drama school. We, I went to, when I decided to be an actor, I, after Cambridge, I went back to college to the Central School of Speech and Drama in London. Oh, when she was and there? And she was this rather exotic American student oh. who came from Studio City, California, to study for three years, uh, a ballet dancer. and. Um, oh. And, uh, you know, it was like this exotic animal to a, you know, f pale face spotted English, English youth. Yeah, but then when you got here, weren't you a novelty? Yeah, she then was I was a, yeah, she was a novelty then, and I came out here and I was a novelty. <laughs> and yeah. did, did, did they all, the uh, casting directors, really want you because you had this uh, accent? Yeah, you know, they'd say, well, they'd always say, can you do an American accent? And I'd say yes, and then they'd say, well, don't, just do an English accent, be oh, English. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah, it was at the time, it kind of went in waves. Sometimes English was in and then it was out. Oh. When I arrived, English was in as the bad guys. You know, they were either the Romans 
or they were the Nazis. With the English or accents? They, yeah, always the English accent. <laughs> if you got an English accent, you were a bad guy. Oh. You were the guys beating up on the, on the nice guys. And the nice guys were always the American accents. Whether you were Greeks or Romans or whatever. You know, whatever were you, you in know, those kind fiction. of things? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, you were. My first jobs were very bad guys. Was it easy to get work? With that, maybe with that uh, accent, it took a little it time. It took it? a little while. I did some equity waiver shows and then uh, did odd jobs to m m earn some some bread and butter. Um, and then after about a year, it started to pick up. Well, then how <laughs> did days start? And then days start. Well, days is a great story. I I, um, I went to audition for this role. It was uh, the role was McShane, Mystery Man, and he was this English bad guy. So that was. And good. He was a bad, yeah, and he Yay. was like you know talking like this, and I made this bad guy <coughs> tormenting this character in the basement somewhere. I'm going to really beat you up and all this stuff. So I did the audition, and they said, "Great, you got the job." And then I got a phone call from my agent saying, they still want you to do the job, but they got a new script. And I'm looking for McShane Mystery Man. There's no McShane Mystery Man. There's a guy called Shane. So I suppose that's me. And he's a butler. So instead oh. of being this tough guy, you know, cockney bloke, I'm saying things like, uh, would you like me to serve the refreshments on the patio, madam? Yes, you and see. And that was it. So I was the English butler who then, uh, it was meant to be a two, three day gig and turned into eight years. Because they liked you or because you served yeah. food well? I served <laughs> food well and they thought I sounded like <coughs> Prince Charles. And um, so, yeah. They but the funny thing is when you say that, you bring up an accent from England because the, all those <laughs> accents are different just like the Americans yeah. have different accents. So you still have to conjure up an accent yes. that's different from what you... Yes, you can conjure up different accents. My accent now is kind of hard to tell. It's a little wishy-washy. But when I'm, I'm back home around my old friends at home, it's what they call RP, received pronunciation, which is kind of a, just a sort of neutral Queen's English, which is actually very unpopular now in England. It's like with the BBC, what when you hear on the BBC, BBC but they don't talk like that on the BBC anymore. B they, they're more Western Yeah, Americanized? they're like, they kind of sort of slight North Country accents, oh, or they're way. slightly Cockney accents, and, and the BBC I sounds see. like a terrible snob now. You can't because, really get away with it. Because they want everyone to be included probably. Yeah, it's more of a sort inclusive. of, uh, yeah, more inclusive, more sort of common denominator. So I, as your role, as your, your, your day's uh, role, you stayed in that same position? Yeah. Did you have any intrigue around you? Oh, Were yeah, you are you kidding? Oh, I, I, was, uh, <coughs> I was in about three comas. I had oh. an identical <laughs> twin, psychotic twin brother. I was oh. married to a hooker. I had a wife I didn't know existed. I had a daughter I didn't know All existed. All of that? I, um, For the I, butler? I got amnesia and thought I was a short order cook called Sam running around the mountains. I mean, I had everything happen so to me. So did you change your accents at all? Yeah, no, it? no. Only Sam. I think oh, Sam the short order cook sounded different. <laughs> But um, no, it was it was a great eight years. I really enjoyed it. That's a lot of fun. They say Crazy. it's just so good for your acting. Well, it's great in some ways. It can you can get some bad habits, but it can give you some really good habits. You learn very fast. You can learn a script yeah. very fast, and you can be very facile at, at almost at improv and kind of making things ha work that may not may need to be sh sort of horned into a shoebox. Um, but you, uh, yeah. So it was a great it was a great crazy ride. So all the while. You were getting ready for the nanny. And then along came the nanny. <laughs> <laughs> you were there a long time, too. <laughs> that was six years, six great years, yeah. But you had a really handsome, you were like the great. I was, uh, yeah, you know, it was, uh, it was, I was very keen to not make it the cliched uh, sitcom dad who sort of was just befuddled and didn't know what was going on and was a bit of an idiot. A little sophisticated. Uh, so we kind of wanted to keep, yeah, I wanted to keep him a little sophisticated and, and, and attractive. It didn't make sense that if we were going to play the romance with the nanny, if he was a complete dweeb, uh, well, that he wouldn't be. So we, I was always trying to keep him not quite as clueless as uh, as they maybe would have liked but um and it looking, worked but but i mean the handsomeness had to come through uh so, yeah something came <laughs> through you know it was a great uh it was a great relationship great sort of on-screen romance you know that fran and, and maxwell uh, we got a lot of mileage out of that that was great and yeah. all the while while you were making that were you able to make films because you, you did know every do a now lot and of again films. yeah in the high ages you, you know doing a sitcom oh, is a great that? yeah it's a fantastic job you know you hardly work don't tell anyone no no, but you hardly me. work. You, you, know, you go in three or four days a week, uh, and the writers are always rewriting things anyway, so you go and do a little run. And then Friday, you perform it in front of an audience. Uh. And then every fourth week, you get off anyway. And then you're done after six months. You know, half the year, you're on, and half the year off. So on that half year you're off, you can go and do movies. And Did you do Town then? 
You're in town came after the nanny had finished. Little known fact, you were on yeah, Broadway. Yeah, on Broadway. I, were you I singing know. and dancing? I was or singing was and dancing. I was singing and dancing on Broadway. I mean, uh, really, <laughs> if my friends could see me now, it, I had no idea I'd be doing that. How long were you in that? Uh, it was only about five, six months. But that also got Tony Awards. It won three Tonys, not with me. I took over from John Cullum who oh, created the role uh, and then had to go, he had other projects he had to go and do. So I took over in the last six months um, before they actually tore the theater down. They couldn't get us out. They had to tear the theater down. I went and saw it. One day it was raining oh, and yeah? I rushed over there. Th that was the closest theater. I was going like, why am I seeing your town? But wasn't but it, it fun? Was good. It was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It was this fantastic show. That was a great, uh, a great yeah. experience. Yeah. Yeah. Now tell us about this newest project. You play Melvin Douglas. Melvin Douglas, which is uh, really exciting. Melvin Douglas, this is a play written by Wendy Cout and Michelle Willems and uh, it's called uh, Don't Blame Me, I Voted for Helen Gahagan Douglas, which yes. was a bumper sticker and a, and a uh, button um, around the Watergate time because Helen Gahagan Douglas ran against Richard Nixon in his first Senate race for California. Uh -huh. And uh, it was really the launch of his political ca career um, and was the first real dirty tricks campaign. It was the first time that the sort of things that we're seeing more and more of now were, were aired. Um, and uh, she came in for a lot of um, terrible uh, time. I mean, he would call her, uh, on the one hand, an elitist, you know, upper class elitist snob, and then the next minute he'd be calling her a socialist communist. So um, everything was thrown at her. Uh, she was married to Melvin Douglas, who educated her politically. But he was an actor. He was an actor. She was an actress. Oh, she um, was also. And he was kind of an active activist actor uh, through the 20s and 30s and uh, uh, around the time of the d Depression and uh, particularly then later on in the 50s during the McCarthy times. And he educated her, he took her around the country to see all the, uh, the Dust Bowl and the, the Okies and the dreadful things going on in the country. And it opened her eyes and she went, okay, I have to get involved. And that's what this play is about? This You're doing a reading. That. We're doing a reading at the Landmark Theatre. And what happens in a reading? There's well, no it's a sets? stage. There's no set. We, <laughs> sta we, we it's staged beautifully. We have a, a slideshow, which oh. is one of the reasons we're doing it at the Landmark <laughs> Theatre. I see. Uh, so there's a lot of slide. There's an audiovisual component, and then we stand at lecterns and we read. And there's uh, um, uh, Wendy Malick mm -hmm. is playing um, Helen, and I'm uh, playing Melvin. And then there's a Richard Nixon and a man who of many hats plays all different characters. Where do you think it'll go from just being a reading? Is it going to go Well, yeah, Broadway we'd like to see or? well, we'd like to see you no, know, it's a perfect intimate theater type show. Small. Small show. It's like four people, um, simple, uh, you know, you don't need a big set, so you're done with lighting. Um, and it's just so timely. What we're find the reason we're doing so many more of these readings is the timing is unbelievable. It's so uh, it echoes what's going on politically now to such an extent. So, where would you uh, where would you actually have to do it? You'd uh, find a theater and yeah. then do a regular yeah. run? Yeah, well, we'd like, you know, <laughs> something like the Geffen or a, a smaller oh, space, see. you know, or the Taper or the Pasadena Playhouse, uh, uh, um, rather see. than a big concert hall I type see. theater. I so um, we're doing these readings and people are coming to see it and we're hoping that someone's going to go, you know what, this would fit right into our next season. And so uh, we hope it does. So we hope it does. In the meantime, the readings are great. We're getting a lot of people in. We're doing this for the nation. We did one reading for oh, Norman for Lear's people for the American Way. This is for the Nation magazine. So they're is kind it of like a charity event right now? Yeah, it's now, kind of like, like a, it's like it's it's it's, it's killing a lot of birds with one stone. You I know? see. I uh, see. Charity event. Uh, it's something for the sponsoring organization, and, and we're getting to do a sort of showcase for possible backers. And opening your eyes to and the public. And at the same time, fantastic uh, opportunity to see that uh, what goes around comes around. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad you came, and I Thank hope we see it in a big theater soon. I hope so, Joan. Yes. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> and thanks for watching this part of the show. We'll be right back with the artist who has his work on the set, Tom Beards. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Artist, actor, author, Tom Beards, who moved from Wisconsin to take over Hollywood at the age of 21, um, spent three years as the heartthrob on The Young and the Restless. He's written a memoir. He's been involved in experimental art films. He has a 
production plan for a reality show, I think, as an artist. And you have incredible portrait skills. But mm. let's start in Wisconsin. All right. When uh, did you decide to be an actor? <laughs> you know, when I was very young, like five years old, I saw the TV and I thought, oh, wow. I just felt compelled that that's something I wanted to do. You wanted to you do know? it? You didn't want to just watch it? No, 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 no. <laughs> I felt compelled to be, to be on the screen. Did you go to drama school? Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, you did? Not back there, but out here I did. Oh, that's uh -huh. what you did once you came yeah. out here. Yeah, and I got Rob Lowe's manager within, uh, within a couple months, and then within three years I was on The Young and the Restless. But how did you make those connections? You know, Because uh, it's tough. It's tough, but you know what? I mean, I've been in Hollywood 25 years now, and to me it's drive. You know, there are very few actors that uh. I see out here with the drive that I had initially. You know, and I think drive is what really does it. Because I'm telling you, the other guys on the soaps were better looking than me. They were better actors, you know, but I just wouldn't stop. But you, but you were taking classes all the time. So yeah. you were honing your skills mm -hmm. as you were waiting to do. Did you do commercials? Uh, you know, I did a few commercials. But that wasn't like an opening for you, right? No, because uh, I'm a serious guy. <laughs> and, you know, you really got to relax at those commercial auditions. And it was, it was hard for me to do. It wasn't good. <laughs> no, it was horrible. <laughs> I hated it. And did you do other theater while you were doing I've Young and I've, Restless? I've, I've never done theater. I've actually been afraid to be in front of people. You're you know? kidding. No, no. But what I, about film? I'm, what was that experimental film you made? It's easier to do film than to be on the stage? Yeah, to, to me it is. Plus, I've always been moved by by film. I've always been moved by what, what happens on cameras. It's like I can convince myself oh, wow, that's really happening. Whereas when I watch theater, I, I think, oh. oh, these people are performing. They're speaking a little louder than usual. <laughs> it doesn't really look like a bedroom, you know? And I don't let myself fall into that a as easily oh, as when I watch films. That's interesting. You know? So for me, that, that's just the magic. That's really funny uh -huh. because that's what we're supposed to do when we go to the theater, right? right we're supposed right. to believe that bed is in the bedroom. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Very interesting. Yeah. So, um, during your time on Young and the Restless, you wrote a memoir. No, no, it was, af it after, was after the Young and the Restless. I was on the Young and the Restless for three years, and, and then it up. the uh, the month after I left the Young and the Restless, my paranoid schizophrenic brother killed our mother in Kenosha, Wisconsin, with a baseball bat in her kitchen. And how long ago was that? That was twenty years ago. And, and how old was he? He was 19. And he that was, was Troy. Yeah, and he's been, he, he was a problem for four years. He, he would keep satanic diaries. He would write animal killing diaries, uh, satanic poems. He had threatened my mom so many times. She didn't tell me this because I was in Hollywood. Uh, she didn't want to bother me. Uh, so uh, after she died, uh, my priorities changed. I didn't want to be on TV. I wanted to. Yeah, know. what did you want to do? What, what, where could your mind take my, you my, at my, that time? My biggest fan had left. She had left this world. Exactly. So you know, I'd wanted to reach her. You know, so I that that's where most of my time was spent reading spiritual books and getting inspired by uh -huh. that. And then I found myself painting because I've painted since I was a little boy. Oh, I and see. And I never thought that this would be a career. But it's, how did you then? drudge up everything to write your memoir like that. That must have been really difficult. It was, it was very, very difficult, and I wouldn't recommend anybody do it. It's not, is it a cleansing? Uh, it, it, you know, what I needed to do was research uh, my genetic pool. I, I had to figure oh. out, because I also have oh. another brother that killed himself. So you were like in the midst of tragedy, and I can see where you would want to see what's going on. Yeah, I also had other cousins that were schizophrenic. Like three, I mean, three brothers, were you? Uh, there were, yeah, three brothers. Three brothers. Right, right. And one killed our mother, one killed himself, and here I am. Uh, like a, a uh, big star on, in a, Hollywood. A big star closeted because I'm homosexual. Besides, I, was that, do you think that was a big problem? Uh, I think that led to my anxiety. Oh, man. You know? And then uh, it, it also helped the art. Uh, it I, helped I guess. the art. We were talking about the <laughs> right. art because we were saying there's so much feeling in your pieces. Uh, 
So all Thank those you. emotions can, are coming out, continue to come out, but that's 20 years now. Right, right, absolutely. And, and that's where I find myself most in the present. When I'm painting, I'm right there, and I'm not worried about the past. I'm not thinking about the future. Oh. I just feel centered. Just opens yeah. up. Yeah, yeah, and I love doing that. Did you take art classes then? I never did. You, have, you, you mean as a portrait painter, you figured mm -hmm. it all out yourself? I did. I did. What about this film, that experimental film that you worked on? Uh, uh, I was trying to uh, make sense of what had happened to my mother. Oh, it was back to at that time. Yes, it was I back see. at that time. This was in the in, uh, early 90s, and I worked four oh. years using 100 dolls and puppets for a 72-minute feature, and I won uh, three film festivals. I know, that's why I wanted you. So what was the actual uh, content? It was uh, what, she, what she was faced with. It was uh, from the court documents that I received later on, uh, how she tried to get him medical help, and how every time he went to a psychiatric inst institution, he would hurt a nurse, and they would put him in jail. Every time he was in jail, he would try to slit his wrist. They put him back into the institution. And essentially, there was no help. The, no you know, medical help. The, the, I mean, medicine. Med the, med there was, yeah, no rehabilitation. There, were, there was nothing going on. My mother was pleading, he's going to kill somebody. Mm, you have to help know. me. She knew he was going to kill. But she didn't know about herself. I mean. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure if she didn't want it to be herself as opposed to me or other people. When, when you got the documents and you started making your film, and you said you used dolls, mm -hmm. dolls and puppets, mm -hmm. is that a, that's a way that the psychiatrist did uh, uh, worked with psychotics at that time, I think. Is that why you did that? No, the, the reason I did that is because I needed to tell the story because I couldn't sleep that's at night. That's interesting. And I, I didn't, I couldn't afford to pay actors. You know? Oh, that's a really interesting and it, thing. And this was before I considered myself an artist. I was still considering myself a writer and uh -huh. an actor. I had uh -huh. no idea that I would become an artist. But when I look back at that time, that's exactly who I was at my truest self. And the older I get, the more I realize I think unconventionally, like a lot of artists do. You know, and yeah, I am so more you were able to. That's more your calling. Absolutely. Being, so. Um, did you just cut yourself off from acting completely? Uh, I did because it was so... <laughs> you don't act anymore? Well, well, ironically, <laughs> yes. I just got cast in a movie. <laughs> See, there you are. And I, 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 I wasn't looking for that because the auditions were so painful to me. They really were. It was like I was so nervous because I'm an introvert. I love to paint. You know, it's I, amazing that you would even act in the beginning. It and is. You, I know. Tell me about it. It was hard. <laughs> It was very hard, and painting to me is easy. But, but, <laughs> I, but ironically, somebody contacted me a couple months ago and said, would you consider doing this lead in this picture, that we're searching for this guy, and what they want is somebody to play a certain age that has had such experience. And I look younger than I am, so yeah. I can play that age. And then go. And the director knew how deep I could go, you know, emotionally. And so he cast me. So I'm thrilled. So here you are. Yeah. And, uh, you're, and you're painting, you're showing in, um, w we were going to talk about the NoHo Arts Festival, mm -hmm. which is like, uh, what is NoHo? It's North a, Hollywood? Right, North Hollywood, yeah. It, it's, uh, it's booming. It's got wonderful galleries. A it's big area. A, I mean, a, it's... A big uh, re uh, rebuilt area. It's beautiful. There's theaters. There's... Uh, dancing and singing at the festivals. Uh, so they, during the festival, mm -hmm. it's, you said it was all free? Yes. Yes, it's and all And when free. you go to theater and you go into in and out of art People galleries? can do whatever they want, yes. And I'll have my art booth there, and I think like 40 other artists have their they art They set them up in the streets? Yeah, right, right. And it gets all kinds of people. Have you done it before? I have, I have. And they're great people to work with, too. And you know, it continues. It's a yearly thing, and, and I right. understand it continues to grow and get bigger. It does. And do you sell a lot of work at that type of thing? Uh, you know, it's hit and miss. I mean, you never know at, at festivals like that, you know, because sometimes people are there just to have fun. They're not necessarily looking, looking to buy a piece of art. 
So it, right behind us is Heath Ledger yeah. and Jimmy Dean. Right. And you never took a lesson in your life, and yet this painting is just so, such great portraiture. Thank you. How did it come about? Well, right after Heath died, you know, it was like an hour later that I, I realized I felt that he and James Dean had so much in common because I liked Brokeback Mountain. I thought that Heath was such an elusive, uh, attractive cowboy. And James Dean had, you know, died so many years before. So I call that Lost Cowboys. And Hollywood is spelled backwards in the background. Oh, I was going to ask you what that is in the backward, in yeah. the background. Uh-huh. So tell us a little bit about this, too. This I called Barn Castles, which probably has some of my Wisconsin influence. You know, like the silos. Uh -huh. and the, mm -hmm. It's just a fanciful piece. But I do, I do all different styles. I, I, you know, I, I really do. And uh, so people are amazed at that because they come into my galleries and they think, you know, this seems like 20 different artists. But I don't know. There's what, just so many new ideas. All what the kind time. of materials do you use? <laughs> uh, acrylic and oil. You use oil too? Mm -hmm. so it takes longer to dry. Mm -hmm. but Right. And then you did some kind of show where you were just doing portraits, like our portraits. Uh, I painted live at many events. Yes, how do you do that? I've I, I, I painted live at, at many charity events. I see. And uh, yeah, raised, you know, like $100,000 so far for, for different organizations. Debbie Reynolds last year gave me an award for uh, the Thalians group. Oh, yes, yeah. very important work for, they do. Yeah, and for talking about mental illness and for contributing so much through my live paintings. And that's something that I love to do because the truth is, if I'm at a party, I'm uncomfortable with the small talk. You give me a, a brush and tequila, and I'm comfortable. <laughs> and then you just paint. And yeah, Does then, someone then have to sit you for you? Uh, I mean, do you have to sit so that you'll paint the well, person? Or? Well, they can, but usually, yeah, usually I, I don't do that. You don't? How no, do you start your no. project then? Uh, it depends. I mean, if I'm doing expressionism, which I love to do, and there's, there's a lot of expressionism paintings, in the book because a picture uh, is worth a thousand words and, and that's some of the stuff that I just really, really had to vent out. Yeah, like, li 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 fans like that piece. Uh, and, and that's what I prefer to do is just go with my head and not know what I'm doing. Oh, you mean if you're at you a know? party, you'll just paint whatever comes to your mind. It's not actually Sometimes. portraiture. Sometimes. I see, I see. But we discuss ahead of time what they want, you know, because they may want a particular scene or something which they think will sell more. Oh, I see. And then how did something like this come about? Something like that? Yeah. You know, I just started. Uh, I sat down there. didn't know what I was doing. I started with the eyes, did the nose, did the whole body. And then I realized what that was after I finished the whole thing, right? I didn't know what I was doing, yeah. following my instincts, really connected. And I realized this is my mother, an overburdened mother, bent over, raising four kids. My brother, who practically pulled the brain out of her head. This is me, sexless in the eyes of my Catholic mother at a strong period of my life, balancing on my mom because I'm still writing about the family, my sister, who doesn't want to talk about this yet. And I looked over here and I thought, oh, what is this? And, it all and I thought, out. well, this must be when I went to prison to forgive my brother and how naive he was at that point and how much he has grown since. And the empty chair, I was like, what is that? Well, that's my other brother that killed himself. Per perfect. It was thank like, wow. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so, so much, much for coming. Thank and you thanks for, for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Just email at jaquinn1 at aol.com. See you next time.